Aloha. Let's give Joel a thank you round of applause and let's say, yay, God. Would you type that on your screens right now? Yay, God. Yay, God. Hey, we've been saying this a couple of times, but we want to make sure uh, you hear it again. If you're watching on Facebook, please do us a favor and uh, click like, comment a couple of times, and especially if you would hit share, that would put that on your Facebook page as well. All of your friends would have an opportunity to watch worship with us this morning as well, and that would really help us extend our reach. I really hope you'll help us uh, by doing that today. If you're ready to hear what God has put on my heart to share with you today, would you do me a favor and just say, hit me with it, G. I'm ready. All right, here we go. You know the demons were planning on having a party one night. They got beer, Jack Daniels, and pretzels, a little red wine, and some white. They were celebrating how they crucified Christ on that tree. But Satan, the snake himself, wasn't so at ease. Well, he took his crooked finger and he dialed the phone by his bed to call an old faithful friend who'd know for sure if he was dead. Hey, grave, Satan said, how's it? Did my plan fail? Old Grave just laughed and said, Shoots, boss, that dude is dead as nails. Oh, on Friday night, they crucified the Lord at Calvary. But he said, don't dread, in three days I'm gonna live again, you'll see. When problems try to bury you and make it hard to pray, It may seem like Friday night, but Sunday's on the way. Well, a tranquilizer and a horror flick couldn't calm Satan's fears. So Saturday night he called up Grave, scared of what he'd hear. Hey, Grave, what's going on? Grave said, hey, bro, you called me twice. And I'll tell you, once more again, boss, that Jew's on ice. The devil said, yeah, man, but remember when Lazarus was in his grave. Everything seemed cool, but then four days later, boom, he was raised. And now this Jesus is much more trouble than anyone has been to me. And it's got me shook, because he says he'll... Only be dead three. Oh, on Friday night, they crucified the Lord at Calvary. But he said, don't dread. In three days, I'm going to live again, you'll see. So when problems try to bury you and make it hard to pray, it may seem like Friday night. But Sunday's on the way. Sunday morning, Satan woke with a jump, ready to blow a fuse. He was shaken from the tips of his pointy ears to the toes of his pointy shoes. He said, hey, grave, tell me, is he alive? I don't want to lose my neck. Grave said, your evilness, maintain your cool. You a wreck. Grave said, now, cool your jets, Big D. My sting is still intact. You see, Jesus is dead forever, man. He ain't never coming back. So just uh, mellow out, man. Go drink up or shoot up or whatever. Just leave me alone and I'll catch you later. I'll catch you later. I'll catch you later. Oh, no, man. Oh, no. Somebody's messing with the stone. And then the stone was rolled away and it bounced a time or two. And an angel stepped inside and said, Hey, I'm Gabriel. Who are you? If you're wondering where the Lord is at this very hour, I tell you, He's alive and well with resurrection power. On Friday night, they crucified the Lord at Calvary. But he said, don't dread. In three days, I'm going to be kicking again, boys. You'll see. So when problems come to bury you and make it hard to pray, I know it may seem like Friday night, 
But Sunday, 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 I'm preaching to you now, Sunday. Sunday's on the way. Yeah. If you agree with that, would you just say and type, yay, God? Just say, yay, God, hallelujah, this morning. Sunday is here. Sunday's not just on the way, it's here. Happy Resurrection Sunday. So let's read an account from Matthew's gospel this morning. So far, all the disciples knew at this moment was it still felt like Friday night to them. Jesus was dead in the grave. And uh, that's what Barabbas reminded us of earlier this week, right? That uh, he, Jesus took our place on the cross. He became our sins and he put the power our sins have over us to death on the cross. If you're happy about that, would you say amen? So Jesus really was dead on Friday night. Some critics say, oh, maybe he just swooned and there's a whole other explanation. We know the truth. Jesus was dead on Friday night, but something changed on Sunday morning. Now, we've been in this Just Jesus series all year. We've been going through the whole New Testament verse by verse, book by book. We've been in the book of Matthew. We just finished chapter one of Matthew last week with the uh, story of Jesus's birth at Christmas. So we don't have Christmas without Easter and we don't have Easter without Christmas. So thank God that he timed it out for us so that right after Christmas we're talking about Easter today. So we just finished that. Today we're going to talk about Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to jump out of our verse by verse and hit the end of the book. We're going to jump into the end of the story today, Matthew 28. Let's look through the first 10 verses today. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled back the stone, and sat on it at the tomb, right? His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. Can you blame them, right? Well, I mean, what would you do right now if an angel of the Lord, whose appearance was like lightning, wearing clothes as white as snow just appeared in front of you, just like a lightning bolt, zap, right? This lightning bolt strikes right in front of you, right in your living room right now, and it causes this earthquake, and the whole house is rolling and shaking, and you open your eyes, and there stands an angel of the Lord talking to you. I guarantee you, you would feel faint from fear as well. You would be knocked out cold. Next verse, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Why does the angel say that? Why does the angel say, do not be afraid? Because they were afraid, right? They were afraid, just like you and I would be. But you know what? That command, do not be afraid, sometimes it's worded, fear not. That command happens 70 times in the New Testament. You believe that? 70 times in the New Testament, God tells us, don't be afraid. We've talked about the intentional symbology of numbers in the New Testament and in the Old Testament in Jewish thought in general. We've talked about how seven is the number of divine completion, the number of divine perfection. We've talked about how 10 is the totality number for human perfection, human ability. And so often scripture uses multiples of sevens and multiples of tens to make a symbolic point along the way. And it's not an accident, I think, that do not fear occurs seven times, ten times. God is saying to humans, seven is saying to ten, do not be afraid. God doesn't want us to be afraid. Let's also look at what the Apostle John, the closest of all of Jesus' disciples, tells us about fear and about fear's inverse relationship to the love of God. Look at what he says in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Would you say that aloud with me? God is love. Maybe type that on your screens. God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Why? So that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides 
in us and his love is perfected in us. So in a way, we do get to see God. We see God at work, God in action, right? By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. His Holy Spirit lives inside of us if we are followers of Jesus. Verse 14, we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. And here's the big kicker, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. If you haven't made that decision yet in your life, I'm going to give you a couple of chances today before we're done to make that decision, to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to receive him as the Lord and Savior of your life so that God will abide in you and you will abide in God and you don't have to be afraid of anything. Let's get back to the scripture. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Again, John wants to tell us this. He doesn't want us to miss it. God is love. Would you type that again? God is love, like you really believe it. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Verse 17, by this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. When the day of judgment comes, we don't have to be afraid. We can be confident that we will come through it unscathed. Why? Because as he is, so also are we in this world. If we are followers of Jesus, we are credited with his righteousness. We belong to him. We don't have to be afraid of anything, not even judgment day. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. If you really know that God loves you, if you really believe who God is and how he's connected with you in your life, then you won't be afraid of anything, not even death. Verse 19, we love, why? Because he first loved us. That's the only reason we know love is because God is love and he shared who he is with us. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God, don't miss this now, listen, don't miss this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is what? A liar. He's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should also love his brother. So today, I just want to ask you to think about this, to pray about this right now. Is there a brother or a sister in Christ, a friend, a relative, a neighbor, that if you're honest today before God, you would say, I admit I have hate in my heart for this person. I have hate in my heart for this person. If you're harboring that kind of anger, that kind of resentment, that kind of disdain, if you're harboring that kind of hatred in your heart towards someone else like that, if you do, the Bible says it is impossible for you to truly love God. If you cannot love your siblings in Christ who you can see, you cannot love God whom you cannot see. That's what John says. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. Somebody needed to hear that today. Somebody listening today needs to go apologize to somebody that you have hurt. Somebody listening today needs to go apologize to somebody you've been hating on. You need to ask their forgiveness, and you need to try to make things right today. And I can't think of a better day to reach out and do that, to reach out and say, I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for what I did. I can't think of a better day to do that than Resurrection Sunday. Can you? If you can think of a better day, you tell me what it is, but I don't think you can. If you think Easter is the best day to do that, would you just say, yeah, God? Yeah, God. Also, I think somebody out there today is listening who is afraid to come to God. As I talk about beginning this relationship with God, accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I think there's somebody listening today who says, I'm afraid to do that because, Greg, you don't know what I've done. You don't know all the mistakes I've made. You don't know how much wrong I've done. You don't know how hateful I've been towards somebody else. You don't know how many awful things I've said. You don't know how many times I've blown a second and a third and a fourth chance. And so you're living in fear of God. Sure that God is angry at you. Sure that God hates you for who you are or what you've done or what you've said. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. You need to let all of that go right now because John makes it clear to us Our God is love. He is not hate. And that while he may dislike our actions at times, he always loves you. And if you come to him unafraid as a heavenly father, you will experience his perfect love. And we heard from John, God's perfect love always casts out 
fear. Whatever fear you have will be washed away in the perfect love of God. You don't have to be afraid of even judgment day if you have been enveloped by the perfect love of God made accessible to us by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. If you're happy about that, would you say amen? Just type amen today. Come to Jesus today. Experience his perfect love and forgiveness. Don't be afraid. Open yourself up to God's plan for your life. Let's get back to the resurrection story. We left off in verse 5. The angel said to the woman, you remember, do not be afraid. Why? For I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And here's the good news. He is not here. He is risen. We've all said that several times this morning to other people, right? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Just as he said, the angel says, come and see the place where he lay. If you don't believe me, come look. The tomb is empty. He is not here. And then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. In other words, the angel says, I did my job. I did what God sent me here to do. I told you. Now go do something about it, right? That's where I'm going to end today. I told you. Now go do something about it. So can you imagine? Let's think about this. Your very very best friend, let's say they died Friday. And as you're visiting the cemetery today to lay flowers on their grave, suddenly an angel appears in front of you when a bolt of lightning cracks that tombstone in half. The grave just opens up as a big empty hole in the ground in front of you. And the angel says, hey, your friend's not here. He's risen from the dead. What would you do? You would run back home and you would tell all your friends and all your family that you would see later at your house, right? Oh, what an overwhelming joy everybody would hear, feel at hearing that news. And yet Jesus promised us every day, he promises us, every one of our loved one who follows him in this life, that's what's going to happen for them one day. One day they will rise from the dead and they will be forever with him. What more motivation do we need to tell people about the love of Jesus and the promise of eternal life for those who follow him that even if we die, even when we die, we will live again if we know Jesus. Let's get back to the resurrection story. Verse 8, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. I'm so glad that God led Joel to sing that joyful, joyful song this morning because that's the overwhelming emotion that was happening in these women this day, overwhelmed with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus himself met them. There's Jesus right in front of them as well. Greetings, he says. What'd they do? They came to him, they clasped his feet, and they worshiped him. Again, can you imagine? Can you just imagine? How many of you would give anything and everything in your life to have this kind of personal, physical, hands-on experience with Jesus? To have the risen Jesus appear just like the angel of the Lord did, suddenly just zap, Jesus is standing right in front of your couch right now, in a physical body with you right now. What would you do? Would you do what these women did? Would you jump up and run to him with overwhelming joy? Would you drop to the ground before him, grab onto his feet and just hold on to him, hoping he never leaves again and just worshiping him with absolute joy? Well, listen to me. Listen, don't miss this. Listen, Jesus is in the room with you right this very moment. You don't see his physical form, but his Holy Spirit is there with you wherever you are right now. And it gets even better than that. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit isn't just around you, near you. He's in you. He lives in you and through you. You've got that same experience that these women have. So what do you do about that? Are you spontaneously joyful all the time over that reality? Are you worshiping God in your spirit all the time over the joy of that reality? So here it is. What's your reaction to that news right now? Just think about it. Jesus is with you. He's not against you. Jesus is for you. He's not against you. What's your reaction? I hope it is always that you run to him in your spirit, fall to his feet in joy, hold tight to him, and worship him. Back to the resurrection story. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. There it is again. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. What's the first thing Jesus says to them? Do not be afraid. Why? Because they were afraid, right? Oh my gosh, there's another person, you know, zapping in front of me. What's going on? People popping into existence right in front of you. That would shake you up too. Again, like I said, 70 times in the New Testament, 
God tells us, do not be afraid. Two times here in the resurrection story, two of those 70 happen within a few verses of each other. Do you think that's the big picture God wants us to take away from this? You don't have to be afraid anymore. Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus has conquered death, grave, and hell. There's nothing, there's literally nothing left to actually be afraid of right now. After that shock of seeing Jesus alive in front of you, he soothes you with this, hey, hey, it's okay, it's going to be okay, don't be afraid. What's your next emotion? What's your next reaction? Doesn't that make you feel full of joy? If that makes you feel full of joy, would you type yay God or maybe hallelujah or maybe you do a little Brother Hogan, whoop, glory. Maybe you do one of those for me just to tell me how you're feeling this morning. I want to sing a little hymn for you this morning. This is uh, by request from my dear mommy who is in Ohio and I miss her like crazy. I wish I could go give her a hug and I can't. So this is a virtual hug from me to my mommy as I sing her favorite Easter hymn for her this morning. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, sing it with me, it's on the screens. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Verse two. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. But up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Last verse. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. I love you, mummy. Now, while Easter is first and foremost, of course, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, it is also symbolic of all new beginnings in our life. It reminds us that God can always turn anything around. Anything that's gone wrong, God can put it back right again. Even when we receive that awful, terrifying diagnosis, God can turn things around. Even when we lose our job, God can turn things around. Even when we lose our home, God can turn things around. Even when we lose our business, even when bankruptcy kicks in or divorce crushes us, God can turn things around. Even when COVID-19 is ravaging the world, God can turn things around. Even if I die, I should say even when I die, because we'll all die someday, even then, God can turn things around. How does he do it? By resurrecting us just as Jesus Jesus himself was resurrected. Jesus preceded us in death so that he could precede us in second life. And he is our guide now to make sure we find our way into eternity with God. So listen to me now. Listen, don't miss this. Listen, even when life seems at its darkest, even when all in life seems pointless, even when our dreams feel destroyed and we don't feel any joy, there's no light in sight. God's message is still clear. He will still win in the end. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Our God is still large and in charge of His universe, and we trust you, Lord. If you trust Him, would you just say, yeah, God? See, I still believe God's going to turn things around in this pandemic. If you believe that, say amen. We know it might not happen on our timetable. It might not happen on our schedule. It might not happen in the way we want it to happen, when we want it to happen, but it will happen. Hope survives, and life always 
finds a way. Things in our life might not change for the better in this very moment. Depending on where you are, things might not change for the better today or by the end of this month or maybe even by the end of this year, but they will one day turn around, turn the corner, and change for the better. The future still belongs to God. So we've already talked about God's love for us a little bit this morning. I want to talk about it a little bit more as the Apostle Paul reflects on how we experience God's love in this world and how we'll experience it even more fully in the next world to come. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Paul says, Love, God's love, is patient. God's love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. You see the connection between what John was talking about and what Paul's talking about, right? We've got to forgive. We've got to make things right with people who we've held anger towards. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Then listen to this next verse, verse 8. Love never fails. Love never fails. We're going to skip down to verse 12. For now we see only a reflection of Him, as in a mirror. Then, in the next life, in the next world, we shall see Him face to face. Now, in this world, I know Him only in part. But then, in that next world, I shall know Him fully, even as I am already fully known by Him. And then Paul concludes, these three will always survive. Faith, hope, and and love, but the greatest of these is love. So remember, I told you we'd come back to this. Remember earlier, the Apostle John says God is love. Paul now says love never fails. So the transitive property of math and logic drives the point home. If love never fails and if God is love, then you can take this truth to the bank. God, like love, never fails. God never fails. And God will always win. That's the big idea of Easter, isn't it? That's the big idea of what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, that God always wins, that God never fails, that good always beats evil, light always beats darkness, life always beats death. Not even death can defeat the plans of God. That goes for the things of God as well. If God is the one who inspires a dream, if God is the one who inspires a vision, if God is the one who inspires a church, if God is the one who inspires a ministry, if God is the one who inspires a movement, then the end result will always be whatever God wants it to be. It doesn't matter what forces come against it. It doesn't matter how hard the darkness tries to defeat the light. God, love, light always wins. God, love, light never fails. So I don't know what's going on in your world personally right now, but God does. So maybe right now you're facing a great difficulty. Maybe right now you're facing an enormous painful trial in your life right now. Maybe you're worried about the safety of your children or the safety of your parents or the safety of your spouse or the safety of your grandchildren or your grandparents. Maybe you're worried for yourself. Maybe it's because of COVID-19, or maybe it's something totally unrelated to the pandemic. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe your career hasn't turned out the way you always dreamed it would. Maybe your finances are severely strained at the moment. Maybe your health is on the decline. And again, maybe it's COVID-19 related, or maybe it's something totally separate. Truth be told, maybe you would say in your life right now that things seem pretty dark for you. Maybe things feel pretty hopeless for you. Maybe things feel pretty pointless for you right now. And if that's the case right now, or if you've ever felt that way before, even if you've not felt that way right now, you can relate to the emotion that the disciples were feeling on Good Friday when they watched all of their hopes and all of their dreams come crashing down around them. As Jesus, their Messiah, their Lord, their Savior, their mentor, their teacher, their best friend, their God, was suddenly dead, and they couldn't imagine how anything could ever be right again. Talk about complete and total loss of all hope, despair, fear. And despite Jesus' repeated warnings that his crucifixion had to happen, none of them seemed to see the result coming. They couldn't begin to wrap their minds around that possibility. They couldn't begin to entertain it. It made no sense to them at all. How devastated they must have been. How lost they must have felt. How defeated and hopeless life must have seemed to them in that moment. Even though Jesus had told them several times he was going to rise again three days later. Even though they saw him do it with Lazarus and they saw him raise the daughter of Jairus back from the dead as well. For some reason they just couldn't believe that Jesus himself could also come back from the dead. Sure he raised others, but who's going to raise him was maybe the question on their mind. 
but as that song I opened with this morning, written by a musical artist named Carmen about a million years ago, I think is when he wrote that, he was inspired to write that song by a sermon by a famous pastor, a wonderful pastor named Pastor S.M. Lockridge. You've maybe heard the, that's my king, that's my king. Maybe you've heard that on Facebook. I've seen that rolling around this week. That's a Lockridge uh, sermon as well. He's also uh, famous for this other message. I'm going to give you a piece of it today. He says, what no one seemed to realize was Sunday was a coming. Sunday was a coming. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a coming. Many years ago, Pastor Lockridge spoke these inspiring words. He says, it's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's a-sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying, but they don't know that Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirits burdened. But you see, it's only Friday, Sunday's a coming. It's Friday, the world's winning, people are sinning, and evil's grinning. It's Friday, the soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross, they nail my Savior's feet to the cross, and they raise him up next to criminals. It's Friday, but let me tell you something, oh church, let me tell you something, Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, y'all. It's Friday. But Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death is won. Sin has conquered and Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard and a rock is rolled to place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. And Sunday's a coming. Sunday has arrived. Yea, God. Sunday has arrived. Christianity's story didn't end on that Friday night. It launched on that Sunday morning. And in the same way, everybody say same way, in the same way in your life, your Friday night moments are never the end of your story. Sunday's always a coming. And I believe that's the lesson God wants you to hear today as well, that whatever pain, whatever darkness, whatever defeat you're facing right now, don't you ever forget, this is just a Friday night moment for you. As our whole world deals with COVID-19, it's scary but it's just a Friday night moment. Sunday's still coming. It will pass on because Sunday's on the way. Sunday's a coming. Whatever tragedy, whatever struggle, whatever loss, whatever difficulty you're facing right now, that's not the end of your story. That's not the end of your story. This is just your Friday night moment. Listen, don't miss this. Listen, your Sunday's still a coming. Your resurrection is still a coming. Don't lose hope of the fact that our resurrection, our Sunday morning, our Easter morning moment is still coming for us. Just like God showed up in Jesus' tomb on Easter morning, that same God is already ready to show up in your life right now as well. He's ready to resurrect your shattered dreams. He can bring a cure to this pandemic. He can resurrect your broken marriage. He can resurrect your crushed finances. Hope is still alive in you and in our world. Faith is still alive in you and in our world. Love is still alive in you and in our world. Remember what Paul said, these three things will survive. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Don't you ever forget, your heavenly Father loves you. He loves you so much. Your Heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts to His children, so don't you dare quit. Don't you dare give up. I know life is tough. I know life is tough sometimes. When pain and sickness and loss and death comes for us, it's awful. I get it. I get it. It hurts. I get it. But don't miss this. It's only Friday night for us. Sunday's still coming. The resurrection is proof that our God is bigger than the boogeyman. 
That proof showed up in the tomb on Sunday morning once and for all drove home the truth that God is love, light, hope, and faith, and that He never fails. He always wins. So here's the question. Where do you hang your hope right now? In this world we live in, where do you hang your hope right now? Where do you hang your faith? Where do you turn for love? If it's anywhere other than in the person and character of Jesus Christ, then you're looking in the wrong place and you're never really going to find what you're looking for. Holocaust survivor Corey Ten Boom said, There is no pit so deep or dark that God's love is not deeper still. So listen, don't miss this. Listen, I'm serious about this. I've listened. I've lived this. Let me tell you, I've been through it all. Job loss, almost dying from pneumonia and an unknown infection a couple of years ago. Devastating catastrophic gasoline explosion injury leading to bankruptcy, almost homelessness, depression, suicidal, loss of almost every friend in my life, abandoned, dismissed, disrespected. I've lived through all of it. I've lived through all of it. I've had my share of Friday nights just like you. And I know what I'm speaking about. If you are facing a broken dream right now, if you're facing an unrealized vision right now, if you're facing a dream that hasn't come true yet, promise me today you refuse to give up. Say, I refuse to give up. You might even want to type that in the comments today. I refuse to give up. I refuse to turn back. I will keep affirming. I will keep believing that God is going to win in my life. I'm going to stay confident that nothing ultimately important can ever be lost in my life as long as I'm clinging hold of God. So let's abandon our lives to God, beginning here and now. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's put the power of our past behind us. Let's press on toward the higher calling of Jesus. Let's get past all of our Friday nights. Let's stop dwelling on all of our Friday nights. Let's stop dying in all of our Friday night moments. And let's embrace that new life that comes in our resurrection morning today. Let's start looking forward to the day when we will meet Him face to face. And all of those dreams, all of those visions, all of those goals, all of those aspirations you were so worried would never happen will finally come to pass. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Light will be casting darkness out once and for all time. Love will win. Hallelujah. Love will win. Jesus is alive forevermore. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Let me close with this song by Keith Green, great old Keith Green song. Oh, hear the bells ringing, they're singing that you can be born again. You can. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing Christ is risen from the dead. The angel up on the tombstone said he has risen just as he said. Quickly now, go tell his disciples that Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world, he is risen. Hallelujah, he's risen. Hallelujah, he's risen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Last verse, hear the bells ringing, they're singing that you can be healed right now. Hear the bells singing, they're singing Christ, he will reveal it now. The angels, they all surround us and they are ministering Jesus' power. Quickly now, reach out and receive it, for this could be your glorious hour. Joy to the world, He is risen. Hallelujah, He's risen. Hallelujah, He's risen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can't wait till I get to heaven and I can hit that last high note. That'll be awesome. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for Easter Sunday, for Resurrection Sunday, for this message of hope, for this message of life, 
I pray that everyone who heard this message today would embrace it to be a person filled with the joy of the knowledge of who you are and what you have conquered for us. And I pray that anyone who's heard this message today who has not yet begun a relationship with Jesus in the way that I've been describing it today would make that decision, would say, Jesus, I have confidence that you are who you say you are that you did what the Bible said you did, that you did what Pastor Greg said you did, that you're going to do everything you promised to do in the Bible, everything Pastor Greg talked about today. I want to believe that. I put my trust, my faith, my confidence, my hope in you. And Jesus, I ask you to add my sins to the pile. I thank you for your offer to forgive me for all of my sins. I confess them to you. I agree that they exist. These are things that I did that were wrong, that made me act like I was the God of my own life when you, in fact, are God. I confess all of those sins. I agree with you that they need to be added to the cross. They need to be put to death. I need to be forgiven for them. And you offer me that forgiveness freely. All I have to do is say yes to you. Yes, be my God, Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. Be the Savior of my life. Lead me to eternal life. Abundant life in this life. A life full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. All those fruits of the Spirit the Apostle Paul talks about. I want that abundant life now. And I want the promise of eternal life in the world to come. So that no matter what I face on my Friday nights here, even when my own death day comes, I don't have to be afraid because I know what's waiting for me on the other side, eternal life with you in a place where there's no sickness, no pain, no sadness, no mourning, no death, nothing evil will ever enter those gates. Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you could say, me too, God, me too. Me too, God, that's what I want. And if you prayed that prayer for the very first time ever, boy, I'd love it if you would just send me an email at whitecoloacc at gmail.com and just say, hey, Pastor Greg, I heard your Easter message and I became a follower of Jesus Christ. I'd love to send you some more information and help you on that journey. God, I pray for everyone hearing this message today, whatever they're facing, that today would be that resurrection day for them in whatever death of a dream they've been experiencing lately. Encourage everyone today, Lord, to turn to you like the women did when they saw you at the tomb, to run to you, to fall at your feet in worship, and to grasp hold of you tightly and never let you go. That's my prayer for all of us today as we continue to worship you. God bless everyone. Amen.